once again to EWTN's coverage of the 8th World Meeting of Families coming to you from the Pennsylvania Convention Center right in the heart of Philadelphia, PA. We've been here all week long on set with John at Bankovic, my co-host, along with two beautiful Sisters of Life, Sister Mary Elizabeth and Sister Maria Kateri of the Sisters of Life. And we wanted to talk to them all about vocations and the family. And you know what's always great? The Sisters of Life, I remember them starting in New York almost 25 years ago, right? Yeah. It's going to be. And, and, and always Father Benedict always used to tell me, the late great Father Benedict Rochelle, about what a glow, what life, not only is it life, but that you exude life. What called each one of you to become a sister of life? I'm actually from here, Philadelphia, local girl, and um, I used to pray outside abortion mills, not even, not far from here. And at the simultaneously as I was praying outside abortion mills, becoming involved in pro-life, I also was feeling this call to religious life, and one of the priests told me about the Sisters of Life. I have a similar story. I was at the University of Pittsburgh studying and got involved with the pro-life movement there and simultaneously was just moved to learn more about the Catholic faith, got involved with the Newman Center, went on retreats, and it was through that just personal encounter with Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament. We were, we were blessed. We had a perpetual adoration chapel there, and you could just go and have a heart-to-heart. And it was there that I heard him calling me to be totally his. It's so beautiful, and I'm, and I'm admiring the beautiful medals that you wear. Uh, there's an image of our Blessed yes. Lady holding the baby, which of course typifies your mission. And, and I want to ask you a question because it, as, as Doug was mentioning, you know, Father Benedict talks about the glow that comes from the Sisters of Life, and it's obvious because we see that glow in, in the two of you. And it reminds me of a great fact, and our spiritual maternity mm. is not dependent upon whether or not we ever bear biological children. We're all called to be mothers. Absolutely. And you bring life everywhere you go, and you stand for life everywhere you go. When you think about that reality of your vocation, you know, how does that find expression through the charism of, of your religious order, but also just in your interactions with each other as community, and then spilling forth into the world and culture at large? Mm. Well, it's definitely, you know, love begins at home. It begins in the family. That's what this week is all about. You know, learning sacrificial love, noticing the other begins in the family. And then we nurture that, obviously, in, in community. Um, Cardinal O'Connor, our founder, used to always say, it's the Eucharistic Christ that forms community. And as Jesus said, they will know your Christians by the love you have for one another. So, so we begin by loving one another as sisters in community, and then receiving that love from the Lord through our life of prayer, then that overflows into our apostolates, helping vulnerable pregnant women. One of the things that uh, the Holy Father did uh, was stop by the Little Sisters of the Poor. Yeah. That was on schedule when he was there in yeah, Washington. Our good <laughs> and our good friends, and of course, like EWTN is standing up uh, yes. you know, for religious liberty and dealing with that. But one of the things I was thinking about with life and being open to life, the young people today, the Holy Father today, when he was talking in Washington earlier about, to the Congress, he talked about at the risk of oversimplifying, we might say that we live in a culture which pressures young people not to start a family because they lack possibilities for the future, yet the same culture presents others with so many options they are too dissuaded from starting a family. And there is a lot of pressure to not start families and not to have a commitment. Do you see that? Yeah, very much so. Yeah. yeah. With the young people, there's, there's kind of this, this acronym, FOMA, fear of missing out. So college kids talk about this, you know, this reluctance to commit to something. But what we've found is that it is in making a commitment that you actually find freedom and exactly. joy. Yeah. Freedom comes in. And actually making a choice that's in line with God's will for you and following it, that out versus it, there's a notion in the world that you think, well, if I keep all my options open, then I'm, then I'm really free. And really, you're, you're a slave. 
Yeah. Well, you're a slave to all of those options, right. and you never find something that's going to work towards your own yeah. human flourishing. It's true. And to the incarnation of Christ in you, you know, there's this this great reality of union with Him. Uh, and and I had not heard that acronym before, and it's it's kind of a frightening one when you think about it, isn't <laughs> I, it? Because I never heard of it <laughs> you know, because deep in the heart of every human person is a desire to make a total gift of themselves to another, whether that's in marriage or in a vocation to priesthood or religious life. And that's where we'll find our fulfillment, you know, and joy. It's amazing, just thinking here at the World Meeting of Families, though, we've been seeing so many young couples with lots of children, and that gives such great hope. You know, I was thinking about the fact your religious order is 25 years old, right? And sister, you've been with the religious order, is it 20 years? 20 years and you and sister for 23 years. years, so almost since the founding of the order, both of you were there. Have you seen your work change? Have you seen uh, some kind of um, uh, progression in the culture towards life or against life? How do you assess this from the vantage point that you have? Well, your, two your, things yeah. I'm thinking. Um, one, we began our apostolates helping women who were tempted to abortion. That was our first apostolate that we developed. And then over the years, women started coming to us who were suffering after having abortions. And so we developed a special retreat program just for them. And they actually helped us develop the program and write it. Um, a good friend of ours, Teresa Bonaparte, has helped us write that program. and. Now that, that's available in many dioceses, and we, we do days of prayer and healing, inviting women who've experienced abortion to come into Jesus' presence and encounter his love and mercy. And there might be somebody who's even watching this program, or you know someone, you know, to, to give that message of mercy and hope and that the Father's arms are open and wanting to receive them back home and to receive the healing and love and to be able to begin anew. We can always have a new start. And we see that with the Holy Father with the Jubilee year coming Jubilee up of mercy. mercy. Yes. And also, you know, uh, Mother Agnes uh, Mary Donovan, your, uh, your foundress and superior, she's giving a talk. There's no vacation from vocation discerning God's calling within one's state in life. And sometimes we don't think of vocation as being in a sense of commitment. But like you were saying about that kind of FOMA thing, mm -hmm. the fact that people are afraid to commit. And sometimes that's because they've seen other people or other situations where they thought people were committed and it turned out not to be. Is, is that what you see as well? Yeah, you can, you know, I had a experience where I went back to university to see some of my old professors and one I really looked up to and then he told me the news, you know, of, of, of getting at a divorce and I was just about to make final vows and I remember it crushing my heart and thinking, how, how, how could you decide not to be faithful to your vows, you know? But it comes in, in line of what Mother's talking about, that discernment, because I thought if he had really discerned, you know, this attraction or that was something that's taking him away from his commitment and thought and reflected more to make the thing, you know, that's a temptation, actually. My, my choice that I made, I made forever, and I should stay with that. And if there's troubles and all, you know, before we started, Doug, you talked about marriage encounter. You know, right. for, there's things that the church offers right. to help one. Retrovise another one that's that's right. out there too. Yeah. Right. I'm thinking about uh, your work with these women who are post-abortive, yes. and I'm thinking yet another sign of this spiritual maternity, because these women come and they're deeply wounded. This is one of the lies and one of the myths yes. that's out there in the culture today, saying that abortion doesn't hurt. It's a solver of problems. Right. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, it, it, it takes something that is not a problem, yes. uh, the, the beautiful coming into the world of another human person created in the image and likeness of God with a soul that is going to go on for all eternity and, and creating a problem out of it uh, in, in the sense of, of destroying the mother even as the child is destroyed physically in that in that great act. Well, what we we'll see often too is I work with directly with pregnant women in I'm in Toronto and Canada is they're feeling so much pressure because it's legal. So one woman said in particular she, her heart immediately was to choose life, and she said, why do they make it so difficult? 
Why is it that I'm even thinking of having an abortion when I didn't initially when I found out I was pregnant? But the pressure out there in society and culture is it makes, makes it harder too. So here she wasn't seeing it as a problem, but society right. kind of, yeah. you know, informing her that she should consider abortion. Why, right, because she has her natural reaction and that's then right. that's... That's right. right. And that's what's beautiful on the retreats because it allows these mothers to reconnect with their children who are with the Lord. And it's a powerfully beautiful grace for them. You know, because they are a mother forever. Once you're a mother, you're a mother forever. And they know that deep in their heart. Well, when we think about that and we see the continued progression against life, the recent scandal with Planned Parenthood and the selling of body parts, um, I'm sure that in your work it can get very, very discouraging and yet you have the love of God to buoy you up. How is it that you continue to move forward day after day? Yeah, that's often asked of us, you know. <laughs> like one of the things that Cardinal O'Connor, which drew me to this community, and it's in each of our cells, and it says there can be no sister of life without joy. And I, too, remember coming and how do you do it? I mean, you're not dealing with teaching children, let's say, which could be a you know, joyful experience, especially little ones. And we support each other. Our first work is prayer. So we receive our strength from the Eucharist, from the Lord. And then each other, we help each other each evening. You know, we come together with joys and sorrows and we share about our day. And if we don't do anything, even we have a tea break about it. So through the Lord and through each other, we're able to, you know, see through and have hope That's for the next very day. Good combination. And it's great to see your <laughs> witnesses, not only uh, for Sisters of Life, and to see all the sisters in the various uh, orders that were here, etc. And there, and we've got the Council of Major Superiors of Women Religious have put together this. Uh, mm -hmm. This, it's about 18 minutes yes. or so for Love Alone, the story of women religious put together by our friends at Grassroots Films. Have you, you've seen it? And it's so people a wonderful beautiful. video promoting religious life and it tells the stories of several sisters and how they heard God's call to religious life. It's available on, on Amazon. Amazon, yeah. We'd like to get it on a religious catalog as I quickly as so. we can, yeah, obviously, and hopefully great. maybe even get it on the air. Yeah. That would be you fabulous. know, I'm thinking too, if it's okay, Dad, some families might be in places where they don't see religious. Mm -hmm. So then a film like that can be helpful so that they can, in fact, be families that promote vocations by exposing their children to religious if they're not in their city. You see, they can see it. And that's why it's so important. We've always thought to promote sisters who wear habits and see religious life because unlike us, who are old enough to be, have been taught by sisters or have had that kind of relationship, a lot of people today don't see the sisters That's like right. yourselves, so like we did before. Home. Okay, well, great. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for stopping by and oh. enhancing our day and our thank audience's you, day, sisters. Oh. Sister Mary Elizabeth and Sister Maria Kateri, uh, Sisters of Life. And we'll be back with much more ahead. A good friend of uh, Joanne. Uh, Jeanette Benkovic, I think. Susan Brinkman, is that the name? She'll be joining us. We're here live at the World Meeting of Families, Pennsylvania Convention Center, live from the heart of Philadelphia, PA. Much more ahead. Stay with us. once again to EW10's live coverage of the World Meeting of Families coming to you from the Pennsylvania Convention Center in the heart of Philadelphia, PA. And we have the heart of Woman of Grace here, of course, Jeanette Bankovic with me, joined on set by her good friend uh, and co-worker, author and speaker, Sue Brinkman. And we're gonna talk about something that is near and dear to my friend Jeanette's heart and also Sue's heart. Young Women of Grace is out. It's a Young Women of Grace study, and I never saw Jeanette. I, I, she was virtually dancing in the halls <laughs> when this book came out earlier this week, and so we, we said we have to have Sue on to talk about it. I'll, let, I'll hand it over to you, Jeanette. Well, thank you so much, Doug, and thank you for holding the book up. We are excited about it, right? Yes, yes. We're very excited about it, and the reason why we're excited about it is because this has been a labor of love that's been in process for well over three years now, mm -hmm. and the concept was that if we're really going to evangelize the world, we have got to reach the next age.
age group, right? And so we determined, based on all of the beautiful comments that we have received from women around the world, really, about how transforming the Women of Grace study is for adult women, that perhaps it could do the same for youth. And so Sue here, I'm passing this over to Sue, <laughs> Sue here uh, really said, you know, that's a good idea, Jeanette, and I think that I can do this. And so she took my book, Women uh, uh, Full of Grace, Women in the Abundant Life, and the Women of Grace study and adapted it. She's adapted it, everybody. She's adapted it for young people. And so this is what we have. And it did just arrive, and it still smells like ink, fresh ink. So tell us, Sue, how is this put together? Oh, my gosh. You know, it started several years ago when I was standing in, in line at the supermarket, and I was looking at Seventeen magazine. Do you remember that when we I, were teens? I do. I remember Seventeen. And it was in our day, it was all full of, you know, um, how to get along with your girlfriends. It had some beauty tips in that and, and everything, and, and how to know if the, the guy is sincere with you and all that. And I looked at the cover now, and I thought, this is a glorified sex manual now. And I thought, and maybe it's not for 17-year-olds. And it was. It's for teenagers. And I started to think to myself, this is after I was driving away from the supermarket, I started thinking to myself, you know, why don't we do a magazine and we'll take the foundation study, Women of Grace, and we'll put it into a magazine format We'll gussy it up with some nice graphics. Gussy it up. Gussy it up. Yeah, with nice, <laughs> nice gossip, <laughs> nice, uh, you know, graphics, and then we'll have um, little departments. So we have our uh, spirit savvy department. We have our girls rock department in here, just like a regular magazine. magazine right, so that right. it would be something that would be fun for them to look at, and we can get this material in front of them. And now, of course, we're able to adapt it because we've had the the, the help of some great teachers. Um, and, and make a study out of it now. And we have a facilitator's guide also uh, right. that's going to come out with this. Just in looking at it earlier, you've got Mary Jo Anderson as a contributor, yourself, Rhonda Chervin, as people know from the network, of course, uh, Genevieve Kanicki as well, and uh, Dale O'Leary wow. and, our, and our good friend Roz Moss as well. So Absolutely. We have a great contributors. In there. And you know what? You really see it, and you really see the heart of the message of Women of Grace in here geared toward young girls that I think are at an age, 12 to 17, that are really impressionable. This is a time when we can reach them. It's also a time when they're being attacked in the world. Well, here we are. We're at the world meeting of families. Mm -hmm. and, and so if we're going to have strong families in the future, if we're going to uh, do what we can for families at this moment in history of man, we've got to step into the void that's been created because of this false understanding of who a woman is. And the whole goal of Women of Grace, of course, is to transform the world one woman at a time uh, by showing her the gift of her authentic femininity in light of her dignity and vocation as a daughter of God. Why not bring bring that to young women at the time when they're beginning to listen to the voices of the world that are convincing them in a different direction. That's right, in a direction that I might say has quite a bit of fallout in that age group with anorexia, bulimia, they're having psychological issues, depression is at an all-time high in that age group, and it's because they feel so much pressure to be beautiful. It's the sort of like the Kim Kardashian type of a look, right. and, and that's how they're beautiful, and that's how they're desirable, and we're saying, no, 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 your inherent dignity as a daughter of God is what makes you beautiful. Yes. That's what makes you shine in the world, and we try to introduce it to them in a way that's kind of hip, as hip as a person my age could be, but I mean, it's <laughs> it's it's and it's laid out well, in a fun slick, way and it, yes very yes slickly put together one of the things too with that is you see that with with young people you always think in terms of the fact the complementarity between men and women and a lot of times really society in a sense is is tamed by its women and instead it seems like you know instead of you know the women taming the men we've decided to turn the you know we've turned the men into women and we've turned the women into men and we end up this kind of where there's total confusion and people are trying to figure out well how am i supposed to react like you said we're living also in a world where everything is photoshopped so yes. unfortunately we're not photoshopped so when you look at yourself in the mirror it's you when you're looking at these other people you're comparing who have been photoshopped to make themselves look beautiful and perfect no one can stand up against that no absolutely they can't the pressures on these young girls are just enormous and emotionally they're not really equipped yet to be able to handle all that and they really internalize it and they, they, they put a lot of pressure on themselves I've got to look like this I've got to act like this in order to be popular and they kind of lose themselves in the whole thing they lose their personality they use what really makes them so beautiful and that's their individuality that they that they were given by God and I think you know the Pope recently spoke about how uh, women in the world right now 
he reiterated that from the Second Vatican Council that really it's up to women right now to hold back the hand of evil. That's right. In this world, that that's our job. Well, that is the message from the Second Vatican Council. Uh, you know, the Holy Father, Pope Paul VI, at that time, in his closing message to women, wrote, and it was spoken that it was for women to reconcile men with life and to save the peace of the world. We take that very seriously. That is a clarion call. We want to train up girls in the way in which they should go, so that they become these women of grace who populate the culture. You mentioned um, women taming man. Uh, uh, Archbishop Fulton Sheen said. Something Something, and this is Johnette's paraphrase of what he said, but he said that uh, he said that the, the, that a civilization rises to the stature of its women. Well, if the evil one wants to take down a civilization, who is he going to go to first? Who's the one that's raising up the stature of a civilization? The woman. He's going to go to the woman, and that's the primordial battle in Genesis. We see it right there. Father God prophesies it. Genesis 3:15. I'll put enmities between you and the woman, between your seed and hers. You will strike at her heel, and she will smite your head, or you, you will strike at his heel, her seed's heel, and he will crush your head. The fact of the matter is, we can raise young women up to be many Marys in the world today girls who are fully engaged in the culture of the time, but not owned by the culture of the time, engaged in it for the sake of evangelization, for the sake of the proclamation of the gift that is theirs by their virtue of woman, rightly understood. And also to save the family, because that's how Satan is going after this family right now, is going after women right. who are the heart of every family. And that's what's happening out there right now, and families are being destroyed by that. Right. Well, who, who can use this, uh, this beautiful study, and how can it be used? So well, I think um, ages, and I've even gone down to 11-year-olds, <laughs> I've, I've let have a little sneak peek to say, could you understand this? And they understood it very well. They, everything in there is written so that they will understand it. There's not a lot of nuance in it. It gets right to the point, but it's very beautiful. The message that it has is very beautiful, very uplifting. And I think 12-year-old, all the way up to 17-year-old, I think would, would really get a lot out of this now, as is a this study. Is something that one would do on their own as a, a young woman? Do they do it in a group? Do you do it with your mother or your parent? How does that work? Or We'd love to have it done with groups, mm -hmm. uh, like uh, homeschooling groups, parish groups. We'd love to have that so that the girls have some peer support as they're reading this. It's a very counterculture message mm -hmm. that we're telling them, you know, that you don't have to be just a physical body. You can also be a, a heart and a soul, and you need to look at that too. Yes. So I think that if you do it in a group, it's really great, but it's also been written in such a way, um, it's like a, in that magazine format, that you can also give it to someone as a gift. Mm -hmm. And it's just something that's fun to look through. There's all kinds of individual exercises that they can do in there, and they can write their answers in there. So it becomes kind of a keepsake for them about where they were, a snapshot of where they are at that moment in time. Well, when it is done in a group, and, and we're actually envisioning young women of grace groups, you know, yeah. that could rise up in, in the junior years, uh, you know, the sixth, seventh, eighth grade years and of, of elementary school. would those be into where there were women of grace group already existed and then you'd create a young woman like an auxiliary kind of thing? Or? I, I would say yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Also within, within the parochial school system, uh, obviously public school systems, if they would be open to it. We have a lot of our women of grace facilitators that are very eager to begin to get this study out to the young women in their parishes. Uh, and, and one of the reasons why we like that dynamic is because we've seen it work with the adult women. One of the byproducts of the Women of Grace series for adult women is that they form the, we call it a sacred sisterhood, Doug. I mean, these women form fast friendships and good friendships. We want our daughters to have good and holy friends right. who help them lead a life of faith. And exactly. And, and they, certain value system. That's right? exactly right. right. And that's true friendship according to St. Thomas Aquinas, you know, that you will the ultimate good for your friend and that's salvation. So you 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 pull around yourself people that are going to raise you up and help you in that process of sanctification and purification. How wonderful if you had young women like this that would be able to uh, buoy each other up mm -hmm. and stand there not on their own isolated but with a whole band of sacred sisters who are doing uh, great things together and living a life in our Lord Jesus Christ Absolutely. and are vibrant and it's contagious. You know, at one of the questions that most of our women of grace get asked is, why are you so happy? Why are you so joyful? And, and that is one of the core values of women of grace. Joy comes. Joy comes when we know who we are in Christ Jesus and we live according to that ideal. We want that for our daughters. We want it for everybody that's watching today. We want them all to have it. It's so well, important. You know, you were mentioning, Sue, as well, earlier about the, the family and the Holy Father.
father earlier today talked about, I cannot hide my concern for the family, which is threatened perhaps as never before from within and without. Fundamental relationships are being called into question, as is the basis of marriage in the family. I can only reiterate the importance and above all, the richness and beauty of family life. That's right. That's right. And such a joy to me to see so many young people here today. Yes. Hearing this counter message and all these great breakout sessions and keynote speeches today, I see so much joy on the faces of the people who are here. We needed this shot in the arm at this moment in our history because we are, family is under such attack. But really, I was just especially joyful to see those youth here. That just that gives me so much hope for the future. Absolutely. We definitely want to make everybody aware of the fact, Doug, that the Young Women of Grace Study, as well as the Women of Grace Study, is available through religious catalogs. Exactly right. That's a very, very important part of the yes, mission as is. well it here. Is. And it we're here indeed. at the World Meeting of Family. Thank you so much, Sue Brinkman, for putting this together and stopping by My here. Pleasure. Thanks and, for having me. Uh, and keep up great work. You know, the, uh, the young women, we need, they need support. So do the young men. But it's a tough world out there. Coming up next, we have a fine keynote address. Our next keynote address is good friend of the network, Cardinal Luis Antonio Tagle, Archbishop of Manila in the Philippines. He's going to be giving a talk on the family, a home for the wounded heart. Stay with us. Why did you sit down? <laughs> Good afternoon to everyone. I bring you warm greetings from the Philippines and from Asia. At the outset, I would like to thank the uh, organizers of the World Meeting of Families, the Archdiocese of Philadelphia, Archbishop Chatu, and uh, the Pontifical Council for Family, uh, Archbishop Paglia, all of you dear friends who come from different parts of the world to celebrate the mystery, the life, and the mission of the family. My task this afternoon is to reflect with you on the family, a home for the wounded heart. Oh. I will try my best. First, I would like to invite you to consider the different types of wounds that we experience and encounter. Then, we will turn to Jesus, the wounded one, whose preaching of the kingdom of God included the ministry of healing. Then we turn to the church, the body of Christ, definitely made up of wounded men and women, yet called to share in the redemptive mission of her Lord and her head, Jesus Christ. And finally, I would offer a few tips on how we as wounded people could be agents of healing in our homes and in the wider home called the church. And since it is the world meeting of families, I brought my own family here. My parents are here, my brother and my cousins. Mm -hmm.
Okay. Wow, so many people. <laughs> so let us start with some consideration about wounded hearts. Of course, the heart here is not just an organ within the body. When we talk about wounded hearts, we're talking about wounded persons. All people are wounded. I guess no one here in this assembly could claim, I have never been wounded. All of us have been wounded and continue to experience wounds in our hearts. There are different types of wounds, some physical, some spiritual, some emotional, some relational, some financial. And there are different causes and different consequences. But whatever the nature might be of a personal wound, it always affects the family and consequently, a person's social relationships. All wounds hurt, but wounds are more painful and hurtful when we see our family members suffering. When somebody inflicts a wound on our family member, we are also wounded. They become our own wounds. But most hurtful are the wounds inflicted on someone by his or her own family members. The sacredness of the family is wounded by that. When brothers and sisters fight over money, when relatives fight over a piece of property, and they say, we are fighting for a principle. What type of principle is that? When the piece of land is more important than your brother or sister, but the world calls that principle. But this is the mystery of it all. Even when homes are hurt by wounds, it is also the home that is the privileged place for comforting and healing wounded hearts. The wounds may come from the family, but it is also the family that becomes the source of comfort and healing. The wounds that affect our families today are many, immense, and deep. I don't have time to analyze each one, but just to give you some examples financial constraints, unemployment, destitution, lack of access to basic human needs, the lack of education, economic and political policies that do not support the families. Of course, failed relationships, infidelity, sickness, disabilities, social, cultural, even religious exclusion or discrimination. 
human trafficking, child abuse, domestic violence, the abuse of women, prostitution, new forms of human slavery, wars, ethnic conflicts, climat climatic calamities, forced migration, displacement of peoples, all of these bring wounds to human persons and to families. And from your specific contexts, your countries, your regions, maybe you can add to the list that I have just presented. Open your eyes, listen to the cries of the wounded, see the wounds and see the causes of those wounds. Wounds, makes, wounds make persons, families, and communities vulnerable to manipulation, bitterness, despair, exploitation, and even vulnerable to evil, to sin. Some people fall into crime, criminality. They start thinking of evil deeds because of deep wounds. Interior division, the division within me, and the external division, conflicts, they all lead to alienation. I don't know who I am anymore. I don't know whether I am accepted by my family. I do not know whether I belong to society. I am an alien. I do not belong. I don't have a home. This is usually the experience of wounded people, alienation, homelessness. You may have a big, big, beautiful house and still be homeless. For what is a home? A home is not measured by how many acres you have on which the building called a house sits. No, a home is the gift of a loving presence. I I remember in my youth a beautiful song. It says, a chair is still a chair, even when there's no one sitting there. But a chair is not a house, and a house is not a home, when there's no one there to hold you tight, and no one there you can kiss goodnight. That's not the end of the song. <laughs> it continues. A room is still a room, even when there's nothing there but gloom. But a room is not a house, and the house is not a home when the two of us are far apart and one of us has a broken heart. Right. Let me finish. I get wounded too. <laughs> now and then I call your name and suddenly your face appears. 
But it's just a crazy game. When it ends, it ends in tears. Then the plea, darling, have a heart. Don't let one mistake keep us apart. I'm not meant to live alone. Turn this house into a home. When I climb the stairs and turn the key, oh, please be there, still in love with me. That's a home, but a house, but a home, a loving presence, the gift of a loving presence, which leads us now to Jesus Christ. The ministry of Jesus. A certain author, Luciano Sandrin, notes that integral to the mission of Jesus, which is the proclamation of the reign of God, the kingdom of God, was the healing of the sick, the wounded, the proclamation of the kingdom of God, the dawning of the kingdom of God, was very often accompanied by signs and wonders, especially those of healing. In Matthew 9, verse 35, Jesus continued his tour of all the towns and villages. He taught in their synagogues. He proclaimed the good news of God's reign, and he cured every sickness and disease. And Jesus instructed the twelve to do the same. In Matthew 10, 7 to 8, Jesus says, As you go, make this announcement. The reign of God is at hand. Cure the sick, raise the dead, heal the leprous, and expel demons. The good news of the reign of God is manifested in healing as caring, assisting people, accompanying them, reconstituting relationships, bringing back a girl to life and restoring her to her family. When God rules, when God reigns, persons are saved, honored, and served with care. Where God rules, wounds are attended to. You see this in the synoptics. You see this in the Gospel of St. John. There seems to be a pattern in Jesus' mission of proclaiming the kingdom accompanied by healing. There is compassion. Jesus is moved with compassion. Then Jesus cares. Included in the caring of Jesus is his anger towards the evil that befalls a person. And then the attention with which he cares for the person. Then comes faith. Usually the healed person manifests faith in Jesus. But in the end, Jesus would tell them to keep quiet the humility of Jesus, the humility of the healer. The healer will not go around saying, hey, hey, you see that man? He used to be lame. He's able to walk now because of me. Praise me. No. The healer comes to proclaim the kingdom of God, not himself or herself.
the proclamation of oneself is the way of the kingdom of this world. That's why the kingdoms of this world operating on ambition, power, self-recognition, they inflict wounds. But Jesus' kingdom is always a humble, serving kingdom. That's why it heals by caring, by compassion, and by love. Some fathers of the church say that in the parable of the Good Samaritan, Jesus was really talking about himself, someone attentive to those left dying on the roads. That is Jesus. He was really talking about himself. And we can agree, yes, he is the Good Samaritan. Every person wounded, even if a stranger, even if an enemy, I will love and care for. Remember, in the parable was a Samaritan, which at the time was considered an enemy of the Jews. But if you want to heal, ha, the test is, are you willing to heal even your wounded enemy? Nobody claps. <laughs> I caught you there. <laughs> but Jesus stops and heals even those who plan to persecute him. Remember how in John 13, he washed the feet of his disciples, including those who had planned to betray him. You heal even your enemies. Why? Why? That is the way of the kingdom of God. Very different from the ways of the kingdoms of this world. We all know the parables of mercy in Luke 15, three parables all about lost objects or persons. The lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. All of them getting lost. But the three parables ended with rejoicing, with feasting, why? Because the lost, now found, is coming home. When you look at the first parable, the lost sheep, the lost sheep probably was sick or wounded. And from a purely pragmatic, economic reason, the shepherd should not leave unattended the 99 healthy sheep to search for the one who is wounded, sick, and lost. That wounded sheep is really a liability. But why? Why would the shepherd look for that sheep? Why will the woman look for one coin? And why will the father 
welcome with such extravagance the lost son for only one reason. The sheep, though wounded and lost, is my own. It is mine. And if it cannot come home, I will carry it home. The elder brother castigated the father. This son of yours, this son of yours, you belong together. But the father said, your brother. The father wants the home to be made whole. And it would not be whole if the wounded brother would not be accepted. No other reason, you are mine, and my home will not be complete without you. You cannot come home, I will carry you home. This is how Jesus presents the kingdom of love and mercy. But Jesus does not only heal the symptoms of our wounds. He does not save us from our vulnerability and woundedness. He saves us in our wounds and vulnerability. He entered our woundedness. He became like us except sin. In his incarnation, he embraced a wounded world. He experienced being hunted down by an ambitious politician. He experienced being a refugee in Egypt. He experienced being lost as a teenager. He experienced being branded as crazy. He experienced not having a home. He experienced the taunt, the ridicule, even of religious leaders. He experienced betrayal of a friend. He experienced the humiliating death on the cross, given only to criminals and he was buried in a borrowed tomb. Jesus heals by being wounded. And according to the letter to the Hebrews, he was perfected. He was made perfect as a compassionate high priest, as a compassionate brother, because he was tempted in every way that we are, except sin. He knows our wounds, and he transformed our wounds into the triumph of love. That's why even the resurrected Christ had the marks of wounds. The wounds will not disappear. In fact, it is the wounded one that saves. So my dear brothers and sisters, since all of us are wounded, no one should be able to say, I have no gift of healing. No, our wounds will make us, if we want them to be, avenues of understanding, compassion, solidarity, and love. Applause. 
those who are thirsty, come to the water. Are we still together? Uh, yes, okay. I now go to my third point. I'm uh, halfway now, halfway through. So from wounds and homes to Jesus, the wounded one who continues praying to the Father as our high priest, seated at the right hand of the Father, bearing the marks of his wounds and our wounds in his resurrected life, beautiful to behold. Don't think that in the resurrection, our wounds, the scars will disappear. No, even if, if they, are wood, they are scars, if they are scars of love, of compassion, of solidarity, wow, they are beautiful scars. For the risen one possesses those marks of his loving concern for all of us. Now that leads us to the church, the home for the wounded hearts. By church, we mean the body of Christ that is present in every local congregation, like the parish, like the diocese, like your religious order or society of apostolic life, and most especially, the family, the home, the domestic church, the church in the family. Being the body of Christ, the church shares in Jesus' mission of proclaiming the reign of God through healing, through solidarity, through compassion. St. Paul says in his first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 12, if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. If one member is honored, all the members share its joy. The church of wounded members Becomes, becomes a church of solidarity and compassion in union with each other, not only in glory, but most especially in wounds. Dear parents, when your child, your son or daughter, will graduate with honors, I always hear this, the remark of one parent, as he or she witnesses you know, the event with tears in his or her eyes, he'll say, oh, my son, my daughter. But when the child does not pass the course and is required to repeat the course, one parent will address the, uh, his or her, the spouse, and say, hey, your son, <laughs> your son must repeat the course. How come when it is about honor, it's my child? When it is a disaster, it is your child? Man, we are one church, one church, one home, one family. The church must embody the redemptive mission of God. Joseph Hartzler, using the insights of the great Canadian theologian Bernard Lonergan says, nowadays, the redemptive mission of the church must be manifested in the church becoming a disciples of authentic persons capable of self-sacrificing love. For it is this type of community 
that will prevent alienation, loneliness, and further woundedness. Self-sacrificing love. The Second Vatican Council in Lumen Gentium, the dogmatic constitution of the church, says that the church is the sacrament, the sign and instrument of the intimate union between God and humanity and of human beings among themselves. That's at the core of the church, intimate union, communion, love, and not alienation. So at the very core of the church's identity is its mission. You are not there to alienate further. You are there to heal, to unite, and to reconcile. A beautiful image in the Bible of a church that heals even when it is wounded is that small band of friends of a paralytic in Mark 2. You know those four friends who, do, who did everything that they could, but when it was impossible to bring their friend close to Jesus because of the crowd, what did they do? They went up the roof. They opened up the roof to lower G their friend to Jesus. That's a family. That's a parish. That's a diocese. That's the church. No one gives up. I won't give up. We won't give up leading people to the healing touch of Jesus. In the words of Maria Cataldo Canaf, the church opens doors to Jesus and sometimes roofs in order to bring people to Jesus. Let me now go to the last portion. Some paths that we could take so that we could promote Jesus' redemptive mission, inaugurating the reign of God within the church as a home for the wounded. First, we must realize that all healing comes from God. It is the initiative of God. Secondly, Healing is situated best in a community, the family, the parish, the school, the band of friends, without forgetting the involvement of the wounded person. He or she must also be courageous in taking the path towards healing, conversion. Let us not forget the liturgical sacramental aspects, baptism, Eucharist, sacraments of forgiveness, reconciliation, the anointing of the sick, the ethical dimension. Joseph Kelly proposes some practices based on the image of the church as a field hospital an image which is dear to Pope Francis. I see some people taking down notes. Please do. <laughs> there is an exam after this talk. <laughs> Joseph Kelly said, if we are serious about healing in a field hospital setting, first, 
we must keep in touch with Jesus, the chief physician. We should be humble. We cannot heal simply by our human efforts, even our psychological counseling skills. We all turn to Jesus. Secondly, let us recognize our own wounds. Facing our own wounds will enable us to be compassionate and understanding to the wounded. Third, we should not be afraid of the dark. When you deal with wounds, oh my, wounds are huh, never clean. They could be bloody and raw. We should be ready to enter that dark world. Fourth, we must accept that the church is a field hospital. We should be ready to respond in emergency cases. We should be prompt with creative solutions. We should be agile and flexible. Fifth, we should infuse the field hospital with hope. We cannot be healers if we look desperate. I don't know how those glum-looking people could even generate you know, trust and healing. You know. mm -hmm. Smile, please. <laughs> Sixth, often when we try to heal or help Jesus heal, we have no choice but to be quiet, silent, no words, no solutions. We just provide a loving presence. Discernment is essential. My dear brothers and sisters, my timer here says, I have seven minutes to go. I will spend the last seven minutes telling you stories, for that's what Asians are. We live by stories. I told this story a few days ago in La Salle University. I, I usually attend the summer camp for young people in the diocese, and one summer camp devoted to finding one's purpose in life, vocation, actually, <laughs> one's purpose in life. I gave a keynote address like this, but very short. After that, I opened the floor to questions. And the first question that I got from a young person was, Bishop, will you sing for us? <laughs> Quite unrelated to the topic. So I said, let us go back to the topic. Ask questions about the topic. And they asked questions. And then came another boy. He said, now, Bishop, will you sing for us? So I said, you did not tell me that I would sing. So let me start a song that all of us would sing, which I did. Afterwards, the young people came in good Filipino fashion asked for a blessing, some had selfies, <laughs> some asked for autographs, some asked me to sign their shirts. Here, Bishop, please sign here, please sign here. One young girl said, here, here, sign here. I said, no, 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 turn around, turn around, turn around. And then that's over. But I was thinking, what, what? What do they think of me? <laughs> am, I, am I a singer? Am I a celebrity? What am I? Do I project myself as a bishop or what? The answer came a year later in a similar youth camp. One boy approached me and said, last year I had my shirt signed by you, bishop. I said, oh yes, I remember. He said, I have not washed the shirt. 
But he says, every night I fold it, I put it under my pillow. I have not seen my father in years. He's working abroad. He has not been home. But with that shirt and your signature, I know I have a home. I know I have a father. Gracias. Muchas gracias. Tante grazie. Un'altra storia. Let me close with this moving story which I will read from an account submitted by a girl, a refugee girl. I was born in the jungle. I was lucky, my mother told me, lucky that I was born when so many around me died. I come from Burma, where thousands have perished in the war between Burmese troops and opposition groups. I was born in the jungle because my parents fled their home to avoid the fighting. When I was in primary school, I had to leave my home village, and from that time on, I would move from village to village to attend school. Until 1992, I visited my parents and brothers and sisters about a year, but I have not seen them since as I have been unable to return home following the closure by Burmese troops of all roads along the Thai-Burma border. So I must live by myself, stand alone without my parents. I have relatives who live around here, but I know I cannot get my parents' love and care whenever I want. I cannot talk to them whenever I want. When they are sick, I cannot visit and look after them. I realized how much I missed my parents when I was sick. Life as a refugee is so difficult. I badly needed my parents to be with me right there by my bed but I could not have them. I burst into tears. It was so hard for me. I was unable to see my parents because of the war. Then I realized I was not the only one crying, and I felt consoled. I know there are thousands of people who are suffering like me, when will there be peace in Burma? When will the war be over? When will the ethnic issues be solved? After years of moving from place to place, I finally settled in the Kareni refugee camps. I was asked to teach at the camp schools. Before long, however, I was selected for an internship in the Philippines. During my time away, I learned more about human rights, and I am now working with the Jesuit Refugee Services in the field of education. We are busy supporting Kareni schools in a number of ways. I am happy and can use my education to assist my people in these difficult times. I was not the only one 
crying. That's home for the wounded heart. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. here at the 8th World Meeting of Families and we just saw the conclusion of the keynote address by Cardinal Luis Antonio Tagle, the Archbishop of Manila. I'm Doug Keck, of course, here with Jeanette Bankovic. And you know what's great about the World Meeting of Families and EW10 as a family? You never know what family members of EW10 may show up. And here we have one, Deacon Harold Burke Sivers himself. And Deacon's got a new book, Behold the Man, that's out there. A Catholic vision of male spirituality, and that was the name of one of the series, the first series possibly you did for us at EW10, right? That's right, the very first one back in 2005. And then you also did one with our good friend Father Milady, right? That's right, priests and deacons, ministers of mercy. Okay, so you're keeping busy. I'm trying my best. Now, you were dealing with Our Lady when you were here, right? Yes, uh, the topic uh, that I was assigned, we had to submit 13 talks, Mm -hmm. and uh, they chose uh, uh, the talk on the Blessed Mother, which I was thrilled. Uh, to give is called Mary of Nazareth, the first disciple and mother of the Redeemer. So basically what I did is I talked about what is a disciple, someone who hears, accepts, and puts into practice in their life every day the teachings of Jesus Christ and the Catholic faith, and how that was epitomized in the person of the Blessed Virgin Mary, and then how discipleship works within the family, and how is Mary's the mother of the church? I mean, she's our mother too. You know, so I, ta- I, I blended all that together in my talk yesterday. When we think about that, I, you know, it excites me to hear you speak of our Blessed Lady, period, because I love her so much. But then to hear uh, about her being the first disciple and she being the model for us within the family, what would be some pointers that you would give to our viewers today and our listeners on how it is that we can take those principles of discipleship and make them come to life within the family unit? Well, I think one of the key ways is Eucharistic adoration. Because if you think about it, and this is a point I brought out yesterday, Mary was the first monstrance. She was the first vessel that held in the tabernacle of her womb the body and blood, soul, divinity of Jesus. Her first impulse after becoming pregnant was to go visit her kinswoman Elizabeth. And after we received the Eucharist at the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass, we are kicked out. You can't stay at the altar. You have to go and actually be Eucharist to the world and live your faith. Um, and, and that quiet period, uh, so m- many of the, the years of Jesus were that quiet period where they're just living the family life every day. And so I think Eucharistic adoration is extremely important. Where we, Psalm 46 says, be still and know that I am God. And when we're living in a world that's so busy and so frantic and so full of noise, so full of distractions, we can't listen to the voice of God and allow that voice to change our life. Yeah, I th- and that's what Eucharistic adoration does. And that's why I think it's because Eucharist is the core, the center of family life. I think Mother Angelica would agree with you about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, when you think about it, Deacon, you know, her first impulse is to take Jesus to another, right? Yes. And that's what she does in entering the home of Elizabeth and Zechariah. But our Lord gestated in her womb for nine months. And I can't help but think that she contemplated the one who was growing within her. And in a sense, she was the monstrance, and yet within in herself, she had the capacity to, to adore the one who is, is Savior, m- m- Redeemer, Messiah. And so she was formed and shaped and patterned after the one that she carried, like we are when we sit before the Eucharistic presence of Jesus. Is it is it 2 Corinthians 3, verse 18, all of us gazing on the Lord's glory with unveiled faces mm-hmm, are right. being transformed from glory to glory into his very image by the Lord who is the Spirit, right? So the idea is that with that transformation process takes place there. That's right. And, the and, and because of that, that's why the Eucharist is so transformative for family life. Yes. You know, we go to Mass as a family. We do all these things uh, centered around the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. But one thing that we're losing, which I think, which I'm glad is being focused and emphasized here at the World Meeting of Families, is really that Eucharistic heart uh, of what the family is all about. Because think about it. Young kids go to Mass today and they say, oh, I'm bored. Because they have no idea why they're there. 
They have no idea what happens at that altar. It has to do with their life every day. Something we talked about earlier today, Doug, right? right exactly. Yeah, and, and, and that's why when we have a better understanding, a deeper understanding of the Eucharist, which I think Mary can help us do, because every child can relate to their own mama, you know? <laughs> so when they, when they see, the, understand the power of the Eucharist through, in a sense, the eyes of Mary, and when they understand what anything at the altar at the Mass has to do with their own life every day, then they're empowered to go out and live their faith because now they're in love. Wow. They're not just knowing about Jesus, they're actually knowing Jesus deeply and intimately and personally. And, and central to the family. Our Holy Father said uh, earlier today when he was speaking to Congress, I will end my visit to your country in Philadelphia where I will take part in the world meeting of families. It is my wish that throughout my visit, the family should be a recurrent theme how essential the family has been in the building of this country and how worthy it remains of our support and encouragement. Yet I cannot hide my concern for the family, which is threatened perhaps as never before. That's right. And uh, I'm glad that he said that because the special people in Congress need to hear that. Right. Uh, because they're, instead of the family being shaped in the image and likeness of God, they're trying to shape God in their in their, their own image and likeness. That doesn't work. Well, and trying to shape the family in the image and likeness of the state. That's right. That's right. So, I mean, because the family is the heart, the center, the core of civilization, culture, and society. And that relationship between a man and a woman has always been protected since the beginning of recorded history. Tribes, nations, civilizations have always protected that relationship because of what it does for all of us, all of society, not just individual persons. You know, this message has got to be proclaimed everywhere, and each one of us, by virtue of the fact that we live in this our day and time, have been called to proclaim the message, right? And when you proclaim the message, I get giddy, because just watching you, I mean, our Lord just, He just, He puts you on fire, and you put us on fire. How can we be evangelizers of the importance of the Eucharistic presence of our Lord Jesus Christ? How can we take the message to the streets and get the word out there that Jesus Christ is Lord, and we have every reason to have hope? Uh, I think a couple things. First of all, the most powerful is the witness of your own life. To walk the talk, to actually live your faith, to not be afraid to talk about Jesus. Uh, you know, not be afraid to witness to Jesus. I think that's key because oftentimes people are looking for Jesus and guess where they're going to encounter him first? Through us. They're, they're, they're looking for miracles, they're looking for signs. We are living signs. We are living sacraments. We have the, the God's divine life within us in baptism, in the, the confirmation, uh, nurtured and strengthened by the Eucharist. We are living signs and witnesses of God to the world. And the other thing is actually going out and practicing our faith in a way that doesn't turn people off or anger people, but true evangelization, you know, the person in front of you to say, how do I get this person to want to listen to more of what I have to say? You know, without compromising the, the teachings of the church, but how do I get this person to be more open to what I have to say about the, the, the truth, the way, the truth, and the life? And I think that's what the Holy Father, by talking about going out to the periphery and trying to open dialogue and things like that, is trying to accomplish. One of the things I was thinking, too, about how the importance the family really is, and our Blessed Mother, in a sense, because it's a place of respite. The family is the place that you can be accepted. Even when everything else is going wrong, you go home and your family's there for you, hopefully a place where you can be built up. And I'm sure that our Lord many times found that with Our Lady, that she was there to, to sit him down, to help him, and for him to always know he had his mother. That's right. And, uh, you know, one important thing it says in the, in the Gospels is that Jesus was obedient to his parents. And obedire uh, in Latin means to listen. So he listened to them, not just with the, the ears on the side of his head, but more importantly with the ear of his heart. Because the heart is the seat of the will. The, the heart is the place where your desire for God resides in you. Um, and we first learn to nurture that and foster that in the home, particularly in the relationship with the mother. You know, that's why I think that Mary is so critical and so important for family life today. And Joseph, I can imagine like after the finding in the temple, they're walking home, Joseph's like, okay, Jesus, uh, if you ever go anywhere again, you gotta tell one of us first, because don't, don't you know, we're, we're really worried about you, you know? So that he, cause Jesus was thinking, oh, I'm gonna do my father's business. But, and sometimes kids are like that, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, they, they, they wander off, they do their own thing, and they don't stop to think about how it's affecting their own parents. So yes. I just love the practicality and the realness of how the scriptures portray family life today. Yeah. And you know, 
know, here, here's an interesting point on that. You know, Our Lady was chosen specifically for our Lord, right? And God the Father knew her from all eternity, and He, he knew that she would be the one. Uh, but so was Joseph. Joseph was handpicked by God as well. And they were always listening to Father God. I mean, in other words, Mary was completely conformed to the will of God. Joseph was conformed to the will of God. So they were able to pass that on to their son. He could hear that. So as parents, we have got to check where our spiritual life is. You know, are we praying? Are we being transformed? Are we opening our heart more and more each day? You know, are we persisting in sin? Or when we catch ourselves in, 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 in a situation where we ought not to be, are we pulling ourselves back? And, and are we willing to go to the sacrament of reconciliation and to repent of that sin? We're coming up on the Jubilee Year of Mercy. I was thinking about the series you did for EWTN, priests and deacons, um, as, as ministers of mercy. You know, we need to take advantage of that, that font of mercy. Yeah, that's an extremely important point uh, because there's so much sometimes division within families. Uh, and, and it's God's love and mercy that can bring the healing that really brings us back to the source and the center of our faith. Uh, which, which is Jesus Christ himself. Mm -hmm. So that, I'm, I'm so glad that you said that. And you said it so beautifully and so <laughs> articulately. I love that. Well, yeah, fantastic. Well, you yourself know that because I remember you telling your story about your dad, right? And, and your own well, situation growing EW10 up. Well, EW10 changed his life. I mean, right. uh, there, there was a time that I did not speak to my father for 18 years. Um, and it was uh, my first series, Behold the Man, as a matter of fact. Someone from, because I was born in Barbados, so someone from my home country called my dad and said, isn't that your son on TV? And so my father's intrigued, he flips the channel, he sees me on there talking about male spirituality. And so he wants to watch the next week, he gets the time wrong, so when he turns to EWTN, I'm not on, but a, a, an elderly nun with a full habit, with a Bible, <laughs> is sitting there saying, <laughs> <laughs> it's laughing. And my father's like intrigued, like, who's this? You know, and he starts watching Mother Angelica. And after a year of watching EWTN and, and, and lighting a fire in his heart, he called me. And that started the process of, of healing with my dad. And he's 81 years old and uh, still on fire for Jesus Christ to this day. And the, the, the key that he uh, reconciled with my mom before she died, which is my, was my mom's main prayer. And, and, you know, that's why, uh, you know, the whole idea that it's never too late, like we always talk about reconciliation, God's mercy. And you've got that book, Behold the Man, a fine series. You do great work there, Deacon. We hope to do more with you. A Catholic Vision of Male Spirituality, of course, published by Ignatius and available through the EW10 Religious Catalog. Check that out. We're just out of time. And thank you so much, Deacon Harold. It's great to be with you. We'll take a quick break. We'll be back with the founder of the Brothers of the Heart of Jesus Community in Magadan, Russia, a great old friend of Father Benedict Rochelle, Father Michael Shields. Stay with us. Thank you so much for staying with us. Doug Keck here with Jonathan Bankovic from the World Meeting of Families, the eighth one, Pennsylvania Convention Center. As we've said, we've been here all week long in Philadelphia and we'll be here, of course, when the Holy Father shows up on Saturday and Sunday. That's when Raymond Arroyo and the boys will take over from us. Next up, an old friend of the network and founder of the Brothers of the Heart of Jesus Community from Magadan, Russia, Father Michael Shields. Great to see you, it's Father good Michael. Good to be here. Uh, and I want to thank you, WTN, for inviting me and thank you for the support preaching the gospel in Far East Siberia. Right, well, thank you so much because you were a great friend of Father Gorshell. He brought Very you good. to the network yeah. and you've been on several times and I guess the last time you were actually on with him with his when he was doing the primetime show yeah, it was, as it's, well. It's been a great gift. I'm sure Father's praying for us now. Right, exactly. And now you're actually in Russia still, right? I mean, you're I'm still working 21 there. 21 years in Russia, Okay. Uh, 35 years of priest. I, I met a man at the conference who's 64 years married, I said, oh, I'm only halfway through my ordination now. Okay. So, you know, Your vocation, you still vocation got more time is just to go, 30 right? years okay, to go. Right, okay. 21 years, and there's been a great change in Russia, especially I, I look at the family um, and the pro-life and pro-family changes. Uh, not many people know that a year ago there was a pro-life, pro-family conference in Moscow, in the Kremlin. No kidding. Yes. Uh, uh, the Patriarch was there, uh, Metropolitan uh, Hillion was there, the main rabbi, the mufti, 
many religious leaders, and the theme was large families are the future for humanity. Mia, yeah, that is such good news to hear, Father, because I know that at one point in time, and I don't think it was many years ago, the abortion rate, that, now this is a stat that I heard, and, and please correct it if yeah. it's incorrect, but that uh, women were having as many as five abortions per woman in, in Russia, and this was uh, you know, a, a prolific enterprise, yeah. and so now you're saying that this is being reversed. It is being reversed. What's happened in the year 2000, 12 is the first time that there are more births than deaths because the abortion rate was 10 births to 13 abortions. And more births. The birth weight now in Russia was 1.3 when I got there. It's now 1.7. Now, a comparison in the United States is 1.8. So, what we're having is an increase of pro life and pro family. The government itself has banned abortion advertisement. 20-week abortions, very difficult to, difficult to get. Any abortion, you have to have counseling now. It's a, it, it's a real change. Now, this is the country that was the first country to legalize abortions in 1917. This was the country when uh, Marx and Engels said the first real class struggle is to dissolve the monogamous relationship man and woman, so there'd be, the gender would be the same. This is the country that Lenin says, destroy the family, you destroy the country. Right. The poison was set out. Now we're having a country uh, exactly in, in a, uh, opposite because of the demographics, but I think because of Our Lady, I think because uh, they have a call. Russia has a call, I believe. And, and this pro-life conference, at the end, the, the Russian uh, Minister of Culture said, Russia will stand for traditional family and marriage, even in the West is putting ideological pressure on us, and they are. And so what we have is this conference, there were 50 countries represented, there's 100 here at this conference, thousands of Russians, high-level pro-life and pro-family people giving presentations. Uh, you can all find this on the email, on, on the uh, internet, uh, first, Andrew, first call Andrew.com. FirstCallAndrew.com. Uh, it's and a, it's a Russian. Yeah, okay. it's, it's Apostle Andrew. First, uh, call Andrew uh -huh. com. And so, what you have is a country. I think, in, in some ways, standing against what I believe is is the is the onslaught ideological onslaught against family and against marriage and against life. I want to pick up on what you said about uh, you crediting this with our Blessed Lady. Yeah. Uh, w w what is the connection there? What are you seeing? And uh, then uh, also, uh, Fatima said that Russia would spread its evil, evil. throughout the world. Right. But then, would at some time in the in the prophecy would be bring light to the world. And I think this is part of what we're seeing. You know what? It, it's interesting because when you think about that, at our you know Our Lady of Fatima appeared in 1917, right? Right. And and that is the very year you said that Russia legalized abortion. Yeah. I've never heard that time. Or that yeah, connection it's, before, it's, Doug. I mean, that, yeah. that's that's provocative, it's, isn't it? It's called like goosebumps. Right God's goosebumps. It is. Here, the 20, uh, 2016 is the the uh, the first apparition of the angel of Portugal, right. Right. and then also uh, in 2017 is going to be the anniversary as well. You know, one of the things too, in a sense, is that what we see with in Russia is the effects. They're suffering the effects of the mistakes Absolutely. that happened a hundred years ago, and they reap what they've sown. And unfortunately, what we see to do in the West is not learn the lessons. We're still running around talking about overpopulation as if there's too many people when countries who don't have them realize that th they are not going to survive if they don't have their own people. Patriot Kirill did an impressive presentation between the Europe before the European Union and basically he said don't go down that road. Don't go down the anti-God road. We've been there. People will suffer. There'll be great suffering. You'll lose much. Now, this is from a country without experience. Huh? Mm -hmm. God is not our enemy. God allows the human flourishing. It is this philosophical point to put God's opposite of humanity or uh, 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 it's either me or thee, you know? In opposition to, the, one opposition one to each right, other. Right, it, it, yeah. The patriarch was saying, don't go down that road. And I think that's a, a tremendous witness, again, to a European Union that uh, obviously is, is seeking that, 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 that path. So the, the, the family life, uh, struggles in Russia, of course. Uh, divorce rate is high. Uh, family, uh, the, the, the father's role in the family is, is, is difficult to, to find a good father uh, model. But uh, in our little parish, we have marriage course now. Uh, we work with pro-life work, uh, of course, our, our pro-life work uh, to keep the young women from having abortion. 
every member of a Porsche has a little card they, they pass out to people said life is precious you know if you need help come to us so you got to Russia in the first place. Well, I'm fascinated to know. I went over in 1989 when Perestroika happened and uh, fell in and out of love with Russia very quickly, but it's a very isolated place, very ugly place. And what I found was um, on a Jesuit retreat, I heard the Lord say, go pray in the camps. Magadan is a former prison camp city. We, were, we work with the repressed that were sent there because of their faith. Many of them are in heaven now praying for us. And what happened was the Lord just changed my heart. And I took on the spirituality of Brother Charles de Foucault and started a small diocesan community, Brothers Heart of Jesus. And uh, the, the, the reality was like Brothers Heart is a vocation within a vocation. It's deepening the priesthood. And I'll tell you, I have never been a happier priest than that I am in Russia right now. It's like there, it's darkness and light were very clear. And you can, you can see the, the, the gospel coming alive. How are you dealing with as far as the, what, do you see a different relationship now than maybe before with dealing, well, whether it be the Orthodox Church or in relation so. to the government itself? Well, the government and the Orthodox Church are obviously very much wedded together. And I want to say right up front that most of us uh, who see what uh, President Putin is doing in Ukraine, uh, we are opposed to it. And many Russians quietly are also opposed to it. In my parish, I have Ukrainians and Russians who sit next together, pray for the end of the war. So that's very clear. Um, the Orthodox Church has a responsibility to preach the gospel as well to the government. And I think there's some difficulty with that because they're so close together. But they're growing. Thousands of monasteries, thousands of churches, uh, young people are coming back to the Orthodox Church. Father, your interior sight, you know, your spiritual vision mm -hmm. is calibrated to seeing that light and that darkness yes. because it's so clearly distinguished yep. there. Yep. What do you see in the United States when you come back here? Mm -hmm. Do you see do you see that that darkness and light is becoming more distinguished? Very much. Very much. I think uh, our, our Catholic community, our Christian community, is going to have to stand, stand stronger and stronger and stronger. You know, uh, John 3, 16 is very popular. How about John 3, 17? He did not send his son just to condemn, but to save the world. That's the job. You and I are in this time when culture is mixed up. The church has its own limp, but it's our time to save the world. And that means, I think, in, real, in truth, we've got to stand a little stronger, we get a little tougher skin. We've got to be able to denounce as well as announce. I, I think uh, what I, I experience in the media is a real closeness. You know, I, I see, you know, they talk about Russian media as being closed. And I think there's also uh, the, the problem here in the United States. So, yeah, darkness and light is being seen more and more and more here. I think that the church uh, can't be a fortress church. We don't want to get contaminated. It can't be a church that has the walls completely open, come one and all. It's got to be in and of the world. In, a, in the world, but not of the world. Well, are you, uh, are you, and I think that's the, the, the difficult. Are you, in, uh, you know, buoyed at all with coming here to the world, meeting of families like this, and in a sense, uh, you know, seeing the other parts of the church in Africa, in Asia, where clearly uh, the family is so important and so big. And maybe it's, it's like the way we've seen, you know, African missionaries coming to the United States or, you know, where it used to be in, in Ireland and we see some of the old bastions having trouble. But it's amazing how our Lord, in a sense, replenishes from, from the most unusual places. I, I'm, I'm rooming with a, a priest from Cameroon who's looking at coming to Philadelphia to help out. And yeah, it's an amazing church. It's an amazing conference. I'm just saying there's a very unusual conference. That there's children here, there's families here, the large families. The church is the most diverse and inclusive organization in all the world. There is no more inclusive organization. It crosses races, it crosses nationalities and language, political positions, it's, it invites everybody to come. Yes. And it's incredible, and you see that at a conference like and this. And the interesting thing about this is the universality of the church in all of this diversity, we are Catholic. We go into this grand hall behind us, yep. and we worship together, and Come we to all the table. Know, we're all together. We know exactly what we're doing. We are yep. brothers and sisters in Christ, yep. and there is no there is no uh, bias, prejudice, or, or, or anything that stands between us. I have a, a question okay. for you. What can we here in the United States 
learn from our brothers and sisters in Russia who were persecuted for their faith? What can we find in their witness that will help us should our persecution continue? Let me tell you, I did an interview of about 90 camp survivors and then we put a small book out because their witness was so powerful. And at the, after every interview, I asked this question, why isn't there bitterness in your heart? And they said, if we didn't forgive, we would die. I would say to everyone here that the forgiveness and compassion and mercy that we experience has to be given out. And that to survive in this trial and to be tough skinned and to be called names, nonetheless, what will save you and convert the other is the forgiveness in your heart. That's what With I would that say. Said, we're just out of time. We could spend so much time talking about the wonderful experience. The Church of Nativity in Magadan. Is there any way people could help you or go to the website and support your work, Father? The website is uh, www.magadancatholic.org. Okay, magadancatholic.org. Okay, great. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Father Michael Shields. It's Thank great you, to see you. Thank you so much. You look terrific, nice brothers of the heart of Jesus' community. And unfortunately, Jeanette, that concludes our coverage of the Eighth World Meeting of the Families. Coming to you today from the Pennsylvania Convention Center, right here in the heart of Philadelphia. Thank you so much for your ongoing support and great work. Those are some great questions. I was very, that was terrific. Don't forget to catch us on EWTN.com, of course, and for our papal coverage, you can see that all. We're covering the Pope in New York and then ultimately in Philadelphia with Raymond and his team. Join us in the conversation through Twitter or hashtag EWTNWMF. And of course, as I said, for Jeanette Bankovic and the entire crew here in Birmingham and all those people working in Washington, D.C. and our, our crew here in Philadelphia, I'm Doug Keck. We'll see you again tomorrow. Thank you.